This is a computer that my brother and I built together, and with a little bit of code, it can beat me at basically everything. Generally, all computers have some ability to do this. And just to give a few examples, a calculator can do computations faster. Our phones can communicate with other phones and computers faster than I can communicate with, say, a friend from college, especially now, because the phones literally have to communicate first. Computers can also be hyper-efficient with their work, working much harder and longer than you or I could without any rest. But there's one thing that humans have been beating computers at for a very, very long time. And I'm not just talking about the quirks of human imperfection that computers currently don't experience, but rather something that we commonly think of computers being much, much better at. And that's data storage. When we're talking about computers storing data from a more mathematical perspective, we immediately go to binary, the language of zeros and ones that abstractly streams through computers in the background somehow, and then for particular strings of zeros and ones that correspond to the papers, movies, podcasts, or other things that we want to save, there is a hard drive of some sort where those are written down and saved waiting to be loaded up again at a later date. Now, you probably have some pretty valid objections to my claim that humans have a higher potential for storing data than computers as we know them now do. I mean, if I asked you to verify any one of the claims about how your brain can hold anywhere from one terabyte to upwards of two petabytes of data, it would be impossible for you alone to demonstrate that without the help of a computer that could do the same. And I would have to define what counts as information stored in the brain as opposed to generated ideas, like, say, writing the script of this video, for example. But let's step back a bit and return to the idea of zeros and ones before getting too ahead of ourselves. The amount of data stored is very, very large nowadays. And it's usually on the order of multiple gigabytes in a single computer on the low end and exceeding multiple exabytes of storage that support cloud computing server architectures on the high end. Since this is the case, it's mathematically helpful to think about the strings of bytes that you want to store as being infinite, or more practically, bi-infinite, since most of the time the strings that you're trying to store is one of many strings of bits that are currently in use at seemingly arbitrary points in the system's memory. By working with these bi-infinite strings of zeros and ones, one can mathematically guarantee that storage algorithms you develop and apply will work independently of such varied large numbers of total bits. And although we often think binary strings are taken as is when they are stored, often there are certain physical or design limitations that make the stored thing a little bit more nuanced than what we intended to store. To illustrate this, we're gonna be looking at examples with solid state drives, which are a type of storage device that use transistors and stored resistances to store information. There are several different schematics out there for how a hard drive stores data. But to keep it abstract, suppose this hard drive here is a Q level solid state drive then each cell can distinguish between Q different resistance intervals or levels that then correspond to some number of bits at maximum the floor of log base 2 of Q. So for a more concrete example, let's take the case of a QLC SSD. The number of levels is 16 because a QLC or a quad level cell SSD or solid state drive is able to store four bits of information per cell. But in order to do this symbolically, we need to translate the binary information that you want to store into a Q-nary string of information before storage. So in storing 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 1 in a QLC SSD, it would be translated into 0435 and then stored as the corresponding resistance levels in four different cells. This is great, but this one schematic for storage devices brings to light a few possible limitations that we have when developing these storage devices. For example, if you make one of these storage devices too information dense, 
just because of the nature of transistors, when you're trying to distinguish between too many levels of resistances, this can lead to drift in the recorded levels of resistance recorded in each cell as you read and write data. This can decrease the overall storage integrity of the device. Along with this, electronic storage devices don't last forever. For example, again, looking at solid state drives, the expected lifetime of a solid state drive is only 10 years. So how are you better? If you're not super sure where I'm going with this yet, you're probably still thinking about our brains, the storage efficiency, and inherent flaws of them along with our limited human lifespan. But there's something more fundamental to data storage in our biology than our brains. It's our DNA. As you may know, DNA is constructed using four molecules, A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. A is paired with T and G is paired with C in DNA. And so you might think that we have another binary system, but it's a little bit more involved as order matters here. So an AT pair is treated differently than a TA pair. And so we can think about strings of A, T, C, and G as possible sequences of base pairs in a strand of DNA. Now, mathematically, the same base framework appears here as there was with binary and electronic data storage devices. We still have an alphabet of symbols. We can still think of infinite strings of those symbols. So things should translate over from a theoretical point of view. But how do we store digital data in a biochemical apparatus? Let's cover some of the logistics first. The nice thing about DNA being a chemical compound is that it can be constructed in the lab. And there are actually several companies and labs that actually use manufactured synthetic DNA for research and development purposes. And some like Twist Bioscience actually specialize in synthetic DNA manufacturing and can create a strand of synthetic DNA based on a desired string of base pairs. Reading DNA, or rather sequencing it, has improved substantially since the first generation of DNA sequencing technologies went into use in the 70s. And although sequencing DNA destroys a particular sample, replication of synthetic DNA can be done at an exponential rate. So as long as you replicate a few times before sequencing, you can still hold on to the stored data. And there do exist mobile DNA sequencing devices like the MinION. So even though you might need to take your base pair data and send it off to a lab in order to get your data storing DNA in hand, there do exist devices out there today that will allow you to do the sequencing yourself. Editing data is also possible thanks to the invention of CRISPR DNA editing technology. And so the last logistical thing we should mention is that DNA lasts for a very, very long time. The oldest piece of human DNA that was ever successfully sequenced was from 430,000 years ago, which is a much, much longer time than the expected 10 year lifespan of a solid state drive. And other electronic storage devices have similar lifespans to the SSD. So we have the tech to read, write, edit, and replicate synthetic DNA when we're using DNA as a data storage device. And as an added bonus, we can store this data store in DNA for a much longer time than currently available electronic storage devices. So how do we store data in DNA? Since DNA works on a set of four symbols, much like the Q-level SSD, we can express a maximum of two bits of binary per base pair representative. So you can go and define this code, which translates DNA into binary and vice versa, much like with the resistance levels from earlier. Based on this calculation and the dive into SSDs from earlier on in this video, it can be pretty easy to jump to the conclusion that DNA data storage must be the same as an SSD that can only store up to two bits per cell. But that would be a little bit of an oversimplification since the power of DNA data storage comes from DNA's storage density. 
So to give a little bit of insight, let's go ahead and just do a little bit of comparison. To go ahead and give current storage systems a fighting chance instead of just comparing one computer to DNA, let's take an estimate of all of Google's electronic storage infrastructure. If you believe some reporting on the internet, there are approximately 1.5 billion Gmail accounts out in the world today. But for the sake of argument, let's give Google their desired monopoly over the current world population use of email and say instead that there are 7.8 billion-ish Gmail accounts. Each of those accounts is then allotted 15 gigabytes of Google Drive space for free. That number of accounts then amounts to just over 125 exabytes of data storage available. So let's go ahead and fail to make that number excessively smaller for the sake of illustration. In order to record that much data in one video call, you would need to be on the same video call for more than 29.8 million years. Alternatively, let's just look at one gram of DNA. Why not? You know, just why not? According to an article published in Nature, which is also linked below, that provides a model of a rewritable random access DNA-based storage system. We can create DNA data storage systems that have a storage density of around 4.9 times 10 to the 20th bytes per gram, which is around 490 exabytes. That's almost four times our theoretical world domination of email by Google data storage array thing. That's just so cool, uh, which is mo mostly why I made this video. So at least for me, it's just totally crazy that you can get that much storage density in any resource used for data storage. And although currently today data storage with DNA is a little bit expensive because reading and writing it is highly specialized currently. Uh, there are many areas of active research that are currently working towards making it more affordable to read and write DNA. So there are people out there that are currently researching and developing new ways to work with DNA as a storage system to make it more technically and economically feasible to use such a method of data storage in the future. Despite those flaws, it is still the best long-term data storage solution currently known to man. And it has a very realizable potential to change things like archival processes, which would in turn reduce energy consumption and the cost associated with attempting to store large sets of data for longer periods of time. But yeah, that's essentially all I wanted to talk to you about today. This video I know wasn't totally in my usual format and I didn't go super in depth into the mathy math of what's going on here, but I haven't done a lot of applied things for a really long time and I was still running off the high of the Symbolic Dynamics live stream I did last week and so I was like, you know what, I want to talk about Symbolic Dynamics more, let's talk about an application, which is data storage, something that I personally think is very cool from a mathematical standpoint. And that's how we ended up here. Uh, so if you did enjoy it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics stuff. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.